his hands and feet in that labor. And once he got inside the tabernacle, the first thing he would encounter on his right-hand side is the table of showbread. This is all spelled out in the book of Exodus. The top table of showbread had 12 loaves of, of bread on it for representing the 12 tribes of Israel and how God would feed them miraculously, those 12 tribes, for 40 years. So that bread was symbolic for them. To the left of that would be the golden lampstand. And the golden lampstand, the only instruction I want to show you about the golden lampstand is that God said to light that at evening, every evening, so that there'd be no darkness in the tabernacle because God dwells in that tabernacle. And as God said, there's no darkness in the presence of God. So there always has to be light. So they had to light that lampstand every night to make sure there was no darkness in there. After that, you'd come to the altar of incense where they burned incense 24 hours a day. And the smoke that would rise from that incense represented the prayers of the people. It's like their prayers ascending up into heaven. Uh, then you come to the veil, the very famous veil that tore in two from top to bottom when Jesus died. And on that veil, they sewed two cherubim, one on each side of that veil. And those cherubim represented the cherubim from the Garden of Eden. The cherubim that kept Adam and Eve from returning into the garden. And those cherubim were sewed onto the veil, symbolizing the same function that, that you had to keep out of that veil. Only the high priest could go behind that veil. And he can only go behind that veil once a year on the Day of Atonement. Any other day he would die back there because it would be an unwarranted approach of God there. And if it was any other day but the Day of Atonement or was any other person besides the high priest, they would not survive that encounter with God. So it had to be the Day of Atonement, and it had to be the high priest, and he had to come with blood, because the blood showed that something died in his place. So his death was atoned for back there. Okay, then once you got behind the veil, you got to the very famous Ark of the Covenant. And the main point of the Ark of the Covenant that I want to share with you tonight is that in Exodus 25, when God told Moses to build this tabernacle, he said a couple times, build it exactly according to the pattern that I tell you. He has to, God has a purpose behind the details of the tabernacle. So he has to build it exactly as God tells him to build it. And the most important detail, I think, in that was he said on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, which, we, which, which is what we call the mercy seat, on the lid of that Ark of the Covenant, you're to put two angels uh, one, and the exact wording is one at the head and one at the feet of, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And in between the, those two angels would be looking down at the lid uh, to witness where the priest would sprinkle the blood of the lamb. They're going to witness yes, that, yes, the blood of the lamb was sprinkled between the two angels on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, and that, and that they serve as the two witnesses that are necessary to establish a fact, so to establish a truth, all right? So with that idea, I just want to point out to you on your diagram now that the first thing you would need if you were the high priest and today were the Day of Atonement, the first thing you would need is a lamb. You'd need to bring a lamb to the altar. So what's the first thing we encounter in John's Gospel? Well, John the Baptist introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. So we actually have our lamb for the sacrifice. Now imagine all the different titles John the Baptist could have used to introduce Jesus as God. All these amazing titles he could have used, but what does he use? He says, this is the Lamb of God yes. who's taken oh, away the sin of the world. So we have our lamb okay, based on John 1 for the sacrifice. Yeah, hit that, then we yeah, would hit need the labor. Yeah. We okay. need the labor for right. cleansing. Okay. And I know you have one of those verses. Which one do they have, John? You get down or stop? Oh, that's okay. Um, I have down on mine John 2, John 3, John 4, and John 5. And those four chapters all have teachings on cleansing or purification or teachings on water. They're all representing the purpose of the labor in the tabernacle in John 2, 3, 4, and 5. So now we've had our, we have our lamb. We have our laver. Now we can enter into the tabernacle. And we'll see uh, Jesus fulfilling the rest of this. First thing we come across is a table of showbread. So what's next in John's gospel is in John 5, 6, and 7, we all have bread teachings there. 
uh, I'm sorry, in John 6 and 7, we have bread teachings. John 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000. But it's not the feeding the 5,000 miraculously with bread that's the fulfillment. It's when Jesus says to the 12, gather the leftovers. A lot of people think there's no real point in that part of the story. Uh, but that's the main part of the story. Because when they gather the leftovers, there's actually 12 baskets of bread left over. One for each of them. And that's their table of showbread. They have the 12 loaves now from the 12 loaves of the table of showbread. Where the Old Testament, the 12 loaves were for the 12 tribes. Now these 12 baskets are for the 12 apostles, which who fulfill the 12 tribes of Israel. We see that in Revelation. You have the 144,000, and many people believe that the 144,000 is representative of 12 times 12 is how you get your 144, the 12 tribes of Israel, and then the 12 apostles. And... Um, and, and, and that's how you get your 144,000 typically means endless number, like a, too, too big to be counted. So the 144,000, people wonder what that stands for all the time. Um, I personally believe it just stands for the people that are saved before Christ and the people who are saved after Christ. In both covenants, people are saved. From the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, the thousands that are saved from that, that's your 144,000 symbolically. So not literally, but just saying an endless number of people from Old Testament covenant and New Testament covenant will be saved. All right, so that's your uh, table of showbread fulfilled. The next thing you come across is the golden lampstand. And in John eight and nine, notice how this is going in the same order in John's gospel as the tabernacle. In John eight and nine, in John eight, Jesus claims to be the light of the world. Okay, so he's the light of the world. He says, as long as he's here, it's daytime. And when he leaves, it'll be nighttime. So they're to work while he's with them because, because he brings the light in the daytime. And in John 9, we get this another deeper and more incredible meaning behind the lampstand. Because the lampstand was there because there's no darkness in the presence of God. Well, Jesus is God, so there can't be any darkness in his presence. So what does he do in John 9 and other places? He heals the blind. The blind are the folks who are in the dark. And because they are now in God's presence, Jesus gives them light or he gives them sight. So now there's no darkness in his presence anymore. So he fulfills the lampstand through healing the blind. Then when we get to the altar of incense, this will be uh, the high priestly prayer of John 17. Now this is just a personal thing that I prefer. I'm certainly not saying everybody should agree with this, but when we're taught the Lord's prayer, we're taught that the Lord's prayer is our Father who art in heaven. But that's the prayer that the apostle said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gave them that prayer. That, that, that's our prayer. That's a disciple's prayer. I think the true Lord's prayer is John 17, the high priestly prayer that he gives to his Father in heaven. And one of the glories of reading John chapter 17 is that the entire chapter is Jesus praying first for himself as he's preparing for the cross. Then he prays for his 12 as he's going to commission them to change the world more than any group has ever changed the world. Those 12 fishermen slash tax collectors, etc., cetera, change the world. And Jesus commissions them to do that and prays for them in John 17. And then most remarkably, if you remember from just a few weeks ago, because we did John 17 about three weeks ago, uh, he then prays for future believers. And that'd be us folks right here. And um, he says, I pray for all who believe based on the testimony of the apostles. We believe based on their testimony. So Jesus prayed for us. And what a wonderful, wonderful thing to know is that the Lord Jesus Christ actually had us future believers in mind. All right. So that's the fulfillment of the altar of incense. And then uh, you may have Matthew 27, 51 listed by the tabernacle. I'm not sure. By the veil, I mean. But... Uh, I don't use that verse anymore. That's just the tearing of the veil. I use now a verse from Hebrews chapter 10 because when I read that, I couldn't believe what I was reading because it literally gave you specifically the fulfillment of the veil in Jesus. Because when the writer of Hebrews talks about the veil tearing from top to bottom, it says that that veil was torn. It says that veil represented Jesus' flesh. So when Jesus' flesh is broken on the cross, that veil tears. And, that, and it also means Jesus' body is the gateway to heaven for us. Remember the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
He's the ladder. He's Jacob's ladder. He's the access to heaven. And we see that through the tearing of the veil when his flesh is broken. So I believe it's Hebrews 10.29, I believe it is, or 10.27, if you want to look that up. So the fulfillment of the veil is the flesh of Christ, and that, of course, now brings us to the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. And for that, we will get into John chapter 20 now, where we see that, that fulfillment. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In John 20, verse 1, we read, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So this is Peter and John <laughs> running to the tomb together because Mary has witnessed that Jesus is no longer in the tomb. And then an angel told them that he's risen. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So now you're going to get some descriptive detail of what each apostle sees, what, what John sees, and then what Peter sees, and then what Mary sees. And the development of it is quite important. Verse 5, it says, it says John came to the tomb first, and verse 5, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he didn't go in. So these are the linen cloths that we just read about last chapter that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea wrapped him up in. And it says they wrapped him in about 100 pounds of spices, which is the amount, by the way, used for kings. So guess what they're considering Jesus as they anoint his body with these spices. They consider him a king. All right, so... Um, so that's what John sees. John goes in there and he sees these linen cloths lying there. Now, what would be all over these linen cloths? This is a man that was whipped 39 times down to his spine. This is a man who was beaten by Roman guards. This is a man who was spewing blood from his head from a crown of thorns profusely for hours on the cross. This is a man who had a, steer, a spear jabbed into his heart and blood came pouring from his heart. These would be, this would be a drenched, blood drenched uh, linen cloths that are lying there. Verse six, and Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, so this is the face cloth of Jesus that they wrapped his face in when they mummified him. And many people believe we have that cloth. This is called the Shroud of Tehran. And in that shroud, you can see the imprint of a man's face with facial wounds on him and, and, and uh, apparent blood stains from those wounds. And it, it, it looks like a, it dates to the first century. It looks like a typical depiction of Jesus with a beard, which is most first century men, you know, bearded man and so forth. But uh, they DNA test it, and they do all this test to it, but they only do it off of little corners of it because it may well be the face cloth of Christ. Can you imagine having that in your possession? We may have that in our possession. But this is what Peter sees when he goes in. So John sees the body wraps lying there, and off to the side by itself folded up is the face cloth of Christ, is what these men see. Now, what's the significance of that face cloth? Well, verse 8 says, Then the other disciple came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. Now, it didn't say he believed the first time he went in, but now that he sees the face cloth, now he believes. And I'm going to tell you something about that in a minute. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And I love that because if you think of who Mary Magdalene was, Mary Magdalene was the woman who history, church history, seems to attach prostitution to her. But we don't see any evidence of prostitution from the scriptures. What we do see from the scriptures is that she was a woman possessed by seven demons. 
which is a far worse state than just being a prostitute. Jesus said the worst possible state a person can be in is to have seven demons. And Mary Magdalene's one were shown who has these seven demons. So she was entirely satanic when she met Jesus. And now she's the one who can't bring herself to leave this tomb. Peter and John are able to run from this tomb to go tell others, but it marries, he who has been forgiven much loves much, correct? That's a teaching we get from scriptures. Well, Mary has been forgiven Satanism, a satanic life that she was living, possessed by seven demons. And, she, and then she met Jesus, and now she's the woman who has such great love for the Lord, cannot bring herself to leave this tomb. She's in front of this tomb weeping as the others take off. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And this is the most bone-chilling scene for me in all 66 books of Scripture. It says, and she saw, now think of the Exodus passage where God told Moses, build this tabernacle exactly according to the patterns that I tell you. And the most significant detail was that on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, you're to put two angels, one at the head and one at the feet of the Ark of the Covenant, and they're to witness the sprinkling of the Lamb of the Blood in between them. Because this verse says, she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. So what, what is she seeing here? She's seeing the fulfillment of Jesus being the new Ark of the Covenant. What is going on here? They see two angels, one at the head, one at the feet. And what do we see in between those two angels? The linen cloths. And what are on those linen cloths? The sprinkled blood of the lamb. The exact picture of the Old Testament. And two angels serving as the witness of the shed blood of the lamb on the day of atonement. And what's the sign that God accepted this sacrifice? Jesus walks out of the tomb alive. That was always a sign when the priest walked out alive that Jesus, that God accepted the sacrifice and he walks out alive. So his sacrifice is accepted. So you and I have forgiveness for our sins today. Now, when I used to teach this back in 2005, six and seven, uh, I knew a, a couple who were Messianic Jews. There were Jews who came to faith in Jesus and the husband, both of them actually, but mostly the husband, taught on a television program all about Jesus fulfilling all of the Jewish Old Testament. And when he heard me teach this, he shared this with me that absolutely blew me away. And I've had other Messianic Jews tell me they've never heard of this tradition, so they don't know if it's true or not. But this man, who was a, both a, a learned scholar and a teacher of the Old Testament, said that this is true. He said that in Jewish tradition, um, if a Jewish man had a servant in his home, when the man would sit down for dinner, the servant would have to observe him eating his dinner because if the master got up from the table, he'd have to see what is he going to do with his napkin. Because if he throws a napkin on top of the plate, then it means I'm done. You can clean up. But if he folds it and puts it to the side, it means I'm coming back. Don't clean up. So what are Peter and John seeing that brings them to faith in this tomb? Well, it's when they see that folded napkin to the side of it, that it says they saw and believed, because that may have been their indication that the master's coming back, that he's not dead, that his body hasn't been stolen, that there's no swoon going on, which is a swoon theory that skeptics put forward, that he never really died. He just awoke from a, a deep, slumber from passing out from blood loss on the cross. Well, <clears throat> they saw that and believed because to them that meant something, according to uh, my friend from, from several years ago. All right, but either way, they come to faith in the tomb when they see what they saw. And to me, Mary has the most spectacular uh, view of it all. She sees what only the high priest saw in all of Israel the sprinkled blood of the lamb in between the two angels for the forgiveness of sins. Only the high priest of Israel has ever seen that vision. And now it's granted to Mary. The former demoniac um, is absolutely astounding. And then 
Verse 13 says, then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Now, obviously, she doesn't understand what she's seeing yet, because she thinks only man could have removed that body. Somebody's taken his body, and I don't know where they put him. Okay, she can't see the picture of what God has done quite yet. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now, I love those two questions. Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Because especially when I counsel, what I realize is a lot of dysfunction comes when we're seeking answers from mankind. We get our self-help books, we get our motivational speakers together, and we give ourselves these rah-rah speeches and try to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps type of thing. But it leaves a lot of dysfunction. And when you ask yourself, whom are you seeking? Why are you weeping? The answer that comes in this chapter is this. Because if you're seeking Jesus, all your reasons for weeping go away. He's going to be the answer one way or the other, for your weeping. So, whom are you see woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? But she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Now, we had two phenomenal things just happen. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, he has become the once and for all sacrifice for the sins for all who believe in him. Now what picture immediately comes from that? Well, the first thing we see is he uses the word woman. Now where does that word come from? That word comes from Adam naming the female woman in the garden. She shall be called woman for she was taken from man. That is the literal translation of the word woman in Hebrew is from man. Um, and the wording is very similar in Hebrew, just like man and woman is very similar. In Hebrew, it. it's ish it. and isha. Oh, so uh, ish meaning man, isha meaning from man. So I find it remarkable with so much of the population of the world not believing in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, the creation account, that every civilization calls the female woman in their own language. In their own language, they call the female the from the man one, the one from man. It's remarkable to me that that's stuck when that's our creation account. It's stuck globally. It's just like a seven day week stuck globally. Um, you know, we know why there, a day is 24 hours because that's how long it takes for the earth to spin once. We know why a month is 30 or 31 days because that's how long it takes the moon to go around the earth. We know why a, a year is 365 days, because that's how long it takes for the Earth to go around the sun. These are all solar, not solar events, but celestial events. These are all astronomical events. But why is a week seven days? What happens in space that takes seven days that we time our weeks by that? And the answer is absolutely nothing happens over seven days in space. So why does the whole world go by a seven-day week? Because that's our creation account. Uh, it's a God created in six days and rested in one, and there's our seven days, and the whole world goes with it. There's got to be some credibility to the Bible when we see one, one half of us uh, have our gender named after what the Bible said, and you also see the whole world go by a seven-day week, which comes straight from our Bible. All right, anyway, that's a little mixture of apologetics class and with uh, John 20 tonight, but we'll get back focused in on John 20. But what is happening here? He uses the word woman, and then who does she think that he is? The gardener. So where is this tomb? It's in a garden. So what does Jesus' resurrection accomplish? He's bringing us back to the garden. He's bringing us back to Eden. He's restoring Eden to us. Okay? So sins have been forgiven. When's the last time humanity walked around with God having forgiven all their sins without having to bring an animal to the tabernacle. It hadn't happened since Eden. So God's restoring us to Eden. You see it through the word woman. You see it through uh, this taking place in a garden. It's restoring us to the garden, paradise. 
All right. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. And if you ever wondered what it's like to say a name tenderly, I think if you just imagine hard how Jesus said that word Mary, the one, former demoniac who he now, he let his good buddies Peter and John leave without manifesting himself to them. And he waits for Mary to be alone and he manifests himself to her. And she's like, what'd you do with the body? You know, you're the gardener, you know, you probably saw it, you know, tell me where he is. And he just looks at me and says, Mary. Mary, so, so much confusion, so much strife, so much anxiety. I just conquered death. I just took away your biggest enemy. I'm going to bless you with peace. And I think all of those statements that I just said were understood through the word Mary there. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. As Italian as that sounds, it's Hebrew, okay? Hebrew word for teacher. Rabboni, she says. And I love, of course, selfishly, that the word of ultimate joy over death being conquered, the first word out of the first person I realized is teacher. How glorious for a teacher to, uh, to hear. It's awesome. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Couple things about that. First, I think Jesus is super excited about this moment as well. I think he's super excited because what does he say for the first time here? Throughout all of the gospels, he'll say, my father, my father, my father, my father. What does he say here? I'm ascending to my father. And now he can say this, and your father. I brought you peace with God. So now as Paul says, you cry out, Abba, father. The spirit in, within you now can cry out, Father, Abba, Father to him. He says, I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God, and listen to the unity now, and to your God. It was never said before this moment of resurrection. God, Jesus Christ brought us peace with God through this sacrifice of himself. Now, um, how does that fatherhood work? Well, we're obviously not Jesus. We, we don't have the same relationship to the father as Jesus has as their father-son relationship. But what childhood relationship do we have with the father? Well, it's, it's kind of like this. Jesus is called our bridegroom and we're called the bride of Christ. So we, he's our father through marriage. So I don't want you to look at your father-in-law and get a picture of God that way and go, gosh, my father-in-law is a disaster and I relate to God that way. Don't do that. This is a wonderful, perfect picture of becoming a son, somebody's child through marriage. Um, believe it or not, uh, when I run into men who have issues with God and I ask them about their issues with God and then I talk to them about their childhood, guess what? Those are the same issues they have with their dad. So what they do is they get, take the father figure in their life and they picture their dad that gave them these issues and they put that face of their earthly father onto God. And that's how they see God. God will hurt me. God will make me feel small. God will, you know, rebuke me and call me names and things like that. And they're attributing the sins of their earthly father to their heavenly father. And that's why they don't want anything to do with them. Can't do that. Okay. We got to allow God to be God the way he's revealed himself to us in his perfections and holiness and love and all of those things and not be placing the dysfunctions of the human fathers onto the perfect heavenly father. So, done apologetics, I've done counseling, now let's get back to John 20, if, if we may. All right. So, verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. The other thing I want to say about this clinging is this. You can read five different commentaries on this verse and you can get five different opinions on why Jesus will not let Mary cling to him right now. And the worst explanation you'll ever hear is, well, he lets Thomas touch him, touch his wounds, but he won't let Mary touch him because he's anti-woman. Are you kidding me? Where's John and Peter at this scene? He let the men leave and they're running around thinking, 
the body stolen or something. Mary's the only one on planet Earth that knows that death is defeated, that Jesus is risen, that nothing is the same ever again. When I say nothing is the same ever again, here's what I mean. The tomb was considered the most unclean place for a Jew. They were very unclean if they were at a tomb because it's filled with dead men's bones. So it goes from the most defiled place, but when Jesus is placed in a tomb, what's the picture we just saw? Literally, it's where the Ark of the Covenant is, and that's called the most holy place or the holy of holies. So Jesus transforms the tomb from the most defiled place to the most holy place. And who's the first witness of that? The most defiled person of the New Testament gets that view, and she becomes the first member of the royal priesthood. In fact, it's Peter who will write in 1 Peter that we have all, be, through faith, have become members of a royal priesthood. And where does Peter get that idea from? I think it's this tomb scene, because he knows as a Jewish man that only the high priest could view the sprinkled blood of the lamb in between the two angels. And he knows Mary just saw that and she lived. For her to live through seeing that scene means she has priesthood. Okay, so, so there's people that actually say the Bible's anti-woman. And what I say to them is, why don't you read it first and understand it first and then comment on it? Because you're clearly commenting on it without understanding it or reading it, which is a dumb thing to do. So um, it's a most marvelous picture of equality. Um, if anything, the guy should be saying, that's no fair. The 12 were with them for three years. Why couldn't they see that? You know, if anything, it seems unfair to men. You know, that they missed out on this and even Jesus waits until they leave before he manifests himself. So he has something very special. It's a very tender and special moment left for Mary, this woman here. Now, um, <clears throat> so Jesus can now say, my father and your father to my God and your God. So why won't he let him cling to her, her cling to him? Um, some say it's because he just wants to send her off to go tell the other apostles, and that's possible. But what I think it is, quite frankly, is to me this is a picture of the Day of Atonement, and Jesus is about to be anointed high priest over all humankind for the rest of humankind. The book of Hebrews says he became a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Well, now he's becoming this high priest. Well, when a high priest was getting anointed as high priest, he couldn't have contact uh, with unclean people because it would take away from his anointing. It would cancel out his anointing. So he has to establish himself as high priest before he can be clung to. So he's saying, I haven't yet ascended to the Father to be anointed high priest yet. So you can't cling to me and make me unclean for my anointing. So that's what I think is going on as he's protecting the anointing part. And then... Some will say, and you're going to see for yourself how ridiculous this is, but he lets Thomas touch him. So why Thomas? And they'll say this. I just read in a commentary today. They'll say it was probably just a few hours later that he let Thomas touch him. So he couldn't have ascended to his father by then. Well, that's not what happened. They get the story wrong, and here's where you'll see that. Let's go to verse 18 first. It says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Okay, I actually thought it was in John 20, what I'm thinking of, but it's actually in Matthew's gospel, where Matthew says, eight days later, Jesus showed up at that same upper room, and that's when he appeared to Thomas and let Thomas touch his wounds. It wasn't the same day that he let Thomas touch him. It was eight days later. You can look that up in Matthew's gospel. All right. So, um, so the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Okay, so right now they're cowards. They're afraid of being associated with Jesus who just got crucified. Now, if you were intimately associated with a man who was executed by the government, you might be afraid, too, because there's guilt by association, isn't there? Sometimes you're guilty just by being associated with the guilty type of thing. So they're locking themselves in this upper room for fear of the Jews. We might, they might be coming after us next. And that's a tremendous thing to understand because it's going to be 
by the end of this day, after Jesus reveals himself to him, that these men will never have the word coward applied to them again. These men will go across the whole known world preaching Jesus until they kill him to get him to stop talking about their friend who rose from the dead. So they're super brave and courageous after this. And, and here's the last moment they don't know he's risen and you see that they're afraid. So they're, they're locked up for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst. And what I love about that is this, says the doors were shut for fear of the Jews, yet Jesus stood in their midst. So closed doors, locked doors, no obstruction for Jesus. And he said to them, peace be with you. Now, if you remember from John 18, 17, even maybe even 19, he kept saying, my peace I give you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Okay? He's trying to say, you're going to see some crazy stuff happen to me, some gruesome stuff happen to me, but I want you to have my peace. Well, now he's risen from the dead, and now he can say where they'll actually absorb it, peace be with you. Now, we live post-resurrection, so we should be able to receive his peace the way they're able to receive it now. Okay, they, they didn't know what all the beatings meant, and the death meant, they thought that was the end. Yet Jesus promised them peace through it all. Well, now he can say, peace be with you, because he can say, now you can see that my word is trustworthy. When I say to you before my beatings, you should have peace, I mean it, because I'm going to be able to overcome. And that's true in our lives as well. So he says, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. Now, why is he saying peace to you now? Because what's he getting them ready for now? Listen to these words. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now, what did he just show them? Holes in his wrist, a spear wound in his side. They say, hey, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Can you hear the possible persecution they're going to endure? Hey, the way the Father sent you got you killed. He says, yeah, I'm sending you out that same way. Okay, that's how I'm sending you, all right? So as the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, in John 3, he said to Nicodemus, about being born again. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. Nobody knows where it comes from or where it goes. The same is true with the Spirit. Now, in English, we hear him say, the wind and the Spirit. But in Greek, those words are both the word pneuma. So the pneuma is the word for wind and for spirit. But it's also the word for breath. So now it says Jesus breathes on them. He pneumas on them. And he says, receive the pneuma. So you get all three definitions of pneuma there, wind, spirit, and breath. And so now as he breathes on them, he's that wind that he can now send that Holy Spirit. And what is he sending the Holy Spirit to them for? And I say this because we're going to see again in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they're going to receive the Holy Spirit again. So what's the difference between them receiving the Holy Spirit? Well, we see in this passage that the Holy Spirit goes in them. And that's your salvation experience. As Paul will say to the Corinthian church, you're given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of your salvation. So this is what they're receiving now, I believe. My understanding of this is they're receiving the Holy Spirit for their salvation, not based on the sacrifices they did their whole life. Now it's in their belief that he's risen from the dead and that he's their ultimate sacrifice. Those other sacrifices were just shadows and types of the sacrifice they've beheld in him now. So now as they have the real substance of sacrifice, he breathes on them to receive the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit comes onto them for salvation. So what happens in Acts is these men who already have the Holy Spirit in them, now Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so this upon is the work of the Holy Spirit in power. So... Uh, my understanding of this is when you have the Holy Spirit come upon you in power, then you're going to be able to work in the power of the Holy Spirit, which means the fruit that you get from your, whatever your ministry is or your words that you're saying are, are going to be greater 
then your human ability to achieve, you'll get results that are greater because now you're working with the Holy Spirit's power in you. So you'll come up with words that you never knew to say in a situation, but now you're saying them. Holy Spirit power. You're going to come up with words of comfort to somebody who needs comfort, and you're going to walk away going, thank you, God, because I don't know where that came from. I did not know to say that, but I said that. Look at the impact it's had on them. Or whatever the situation is for your gifting in the Holy Spirit. Your gifting is different than mine. Mine's different from yours. Uh, we all have our own giftings. You can read 1 Corinthians 12, and you can read Romans 12 to read about those giftings. But we all have our giftings, and when we ask for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, and we're taught to ask that. Luke 11, Luke 11, verse 11. Jesus says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for, a stone, uh, asks for bread, he'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for an egg, you'll give him a scorpion. So the obvious answer is none of you fathers would do that. And he says, and you guys being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. He says, how much more? If, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father know how to give good, it says, know how to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Okay? He knows how to give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him for the Holy Spirit. So um, it's something I've prayed many, many times. I'm going to keep on praying for the rest of my life. Uh, I want my results to be bigger than my abilities. And so do you, because you wouldn't be tuning in if anything were in my ability. You'd be doing other things with your Monday night, I promise you. Um, so this is the in of the Holy Spirit. That's the upon of the Holy Spirit. And we see one other work of the Holy Spirit, and that's the alongside of work of the Holy Spirit, the para of the Holy Spirit. And that's when you weren't saved. Yet God's knocking on your heart. The Bible says the Holy Spirit comes alongside you and he's revealing the Father to you in various ways. And that's why Paul can say about people that dwell in unbelief, it's not that they don't know, it's not that they don't understand. He says they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And he can say that because the Holy Spirit's been knocking on their heart and they keep suppressing that truth and their unrighteousness. And that's what Paul condemns them for in Romans uh, 1. All right. Let's finish up the chapter here. Okay. 24. Now Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Can you imagine? You go to a funeral, and then three days later, people are saying, we saw him. Okay, it's going to be a little bit crazy. He said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, because of that statement, this man has got tagged with the nickname what? The doubter, right? He's got tagged with that nickname. I think he's better than that. I think what he's saying here is not, I don't believe you guys. I think he's saying this. Do you know how much I love that man? And if you're going to tell me he's alive and he's not, I won't be able to function. So I'm not going to believe it until I can touch and see for myself. Because one thing that I believe is this, is that there's a direct relationship between vulnerability and joy. The more, if, think about love relationships. If you have been hurt in your past and now you come into a new relationship, you probably have a wall up. And you're not going to let anybody too close because you've gotten burned in the past. And you may think that's a great way to do relationships. So that way, if I don't let him too close, then he can't really hurt me. But what you've also done is limited the amount of joy you can experience in that relationship. You can't fully enjoy that relationship because you're not allowing yourself to be made vulnerable to that person. The most joy you'll ever get in a relationship is when you could say, here's my heart. You have permission to do what you will with it. Because if you love me, you're going to bless me so much, it's going to bring me the most joy. But if you hurt me, it's going to crush me because I'm giving you my heart without any walls up. So you went maximum vulnerability, gives you opportunity for maximum joy. Every compromise on vulnerability is a compromise on joy. Think of God. God had no flaws in his joy before he created us. The union between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was perfect. God lacked nothing when he decided to create us. We don't fulfill any need for him. 
He has no need. But out of love, a being who's described as love is naturally going to create objects to love. So he creates us to love us, but when he does that, he makes himself vulnerable because he's never been rejected within the Trinity. But now that he creates, he's subjected to rejection. In fact, that's how this gospel started. John chapter 1, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. So he, he makes himself vulnerable, but in making himself vulnerable, he has access to the greatest levels of joy for we who embrace him. Okay? It's the same way with parent to child, husband to wife, vice versa. Um, the more you're willing to be vulnerable, the more joy you can experience. Thomas is not willing to be vulnerable here. That's the only flaw I see in him. He's saying, I'm not going to walk around believing that he rose from the dead because if I find out he didn't, I'll be crushed. So I'm just going to say, I got to see it to believe it. And it's eight days later that Jesus is going to appear to him. So that means for eight days, I'll let 10 of them are walking in tremendous joy and one of them's just going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So he loses eight days of his life and what he was supposed to be enjoying from that. Because what does verse 26 say? After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, no obstacle for Jesus, right? And he stood in the midst. Don't you love that? The doors being shut. Why did they shut them? To keep people out. This is the second time in eight days they shut those doors. And it's the second time in eight days he stood in their midst. I absolutely love that. It's like the least of his miracles, the least amazing of his miracles. But it just blows me away. Because I keep seeing them shut these doors and going, okay, everybody's out. That's out. Good. They're out. We're in. And then they turn around and there's Jesus. I just love that. I don't know why. I'm probably getting carried away with it. But I think it's wonderful. All right. So the doors being shut, but Jesus stood in their midst and said, peace to you. Don't you love that's the first thing Jesus wants to say every time he appears? Let me say that again. Don't you love that that's the first thing Jesus wants to say when he appears? Peace, peace, peace. But it's corona, no, peace. But it's racial tension, peace, peace to you, peace. I just took on the devil and death and I won. Can I say this to you now? Peace. I want you to have peace. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And right there, Thomas looks at the others and says, you told him. No, they don't have to tell him. Right? He knows. He says, reach your fingers here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now listen, this is the only time I see in scripture where God allows um, seeing to come before believing. He's allowing Thomas this opportunity to see first and then believe. But watch what Jesus says next. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Now, why is that significant? Because being a Jewish man to call anybody who's not God, God is blasphemy punishable by death. So he's risking a charge of blasphemy, which he could be executed by because he's so overwhelmed with the proof that this is a Jesus I walked with for three years and he has holes in his wrist still and a hole in his side still. And it brings out worship. Immediately he worships. He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. So he's saying, listen, I'm letting you see first and then believe, but let me tell you something. You know who's got the blessing? The blessing goes to those who have not seen, yet they believe. That's all of us now, isn't it? Okay, so we get prayed for in John 17 and in John 20. He says, you walk under a blessing, those who have not seen me, yet you believe. Um, I honestly can't think of other examples now. But I have written in my Bible several times that I just wrote this, simply, believing is seeing. Believing is seeing. You see, so many times, I can think of Elisha and his servants. Elisha is trapped and surrounded by a Chaldean army. And um, his servant can only see the human soldiers that are about to kill him. And they're surrounded by him. Professional soldiers trained to kill, surrounded Elisha and his servant. They're going to be dead. And Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. 
It says, suddenly the servant could see angels and chariots surrounding them, surrounding the Chaldean army, about to take them down. Okay? So we don't see that angelic world, do we? But we're assured by the Apostle Paul that every struggle you've ever had is not a struggle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of darkness in heavenly places. That's who's messing with you. And if the, the surest way to lose those battles against those spiritual forces is to pretend that they don't exist. You never will defeat an enemy that you don't acknowledge first as your enemy. When you acknowledge your spiritual enemies, then you realize you have spiritual friends that are much more powerful. Jesus Christ. Okay, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. If Jesus Christ is in you, then peace to you. Peace to you because you have the greater spiritual force. They try to bring death. Jesus conquered death. You're more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you. More than a conqueror through Christ who loved you. All right. 30. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So what you got to understand is when you read the Bible, you're only getting snapshots of these people's lives. These are just snapshots. This is just a photo album they're bringing you through to show you main events of their lives. They live 24 hours a day, seven days a week for decades and decades and decades. Certainly, you can't read all about them. Now, think about this. There's some people that the only time they're mentioned in the Bible is for something awful. And yet they had good days. And they're only meant for something awful. And, and what makes that makes me learn is the importance of living right every day. Not to put pressure on anybody or pressure on me to not mess up. What you got to realize is there's some people who will meet you, and that'll be the only day that they'll know you. And they'll know, know you for the rest of their lives based on that one day. So you want to live with your motivations being for Christ and his kingdom and let your reputation fall that way. That as somebody that was living for Christ and, their, and, and his kingdom, which means you're probably going to treat people sacrificially. You're probably going to um, treat people better than yourself. Uh, you're probably going to be known for your love and your kindness and, and uh, wonderful things like that. So he says, uh, many other things that were done in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John said, of all the things I could have written about him, the things that I did write about him had a certain purpose attached to him. And the purpose was this, that you may believe, and then through your belief, you'll have life in his name. So direct correlation between your, what you believe and what kind of life you have. Only the one who rose from the dead can give you life after death. If you believe in the one who rose from the dead, then he is able to offer you life after death, as well as peace uh, on this journey that we have here today. So that was fascinating for me because, like I said, I've never done the second half of John 20 before. It's good to finally teach that. And, um, and I hope you saw the beauty of that vision in the tomb. Uh, to me, that's what launched me into, I've got to study the Bible looking for these connections because they're there and they're way more instructive than uh, what you get out of a devotional book type of thing. So um, the Bible is absolutely beautiful and wonderful and uh, inspired. So that's John chapter 20, folks. A week from tonight, we'll do John 21 which uh, is the chapter that I use whenever I begin teaching at a uh, recovery center or if I ever deal with people that have huge pain in their life um, from situations in life that just have devastated them and they haven't recovered from them. John 21 is to me the greatest chapter to understand your pain. So I uh, hope you join me. And I hope you join me not because of pain, but because you just want to know John 21. But either way, uh, maybe we'll see you next week. God bless you guys. And have a wonderful evening.